Hey guys, so welcome to another live stream. Obviously, we got a couple things figured out here with some fanciness. I know there was no audio with the overhead, but we did that on purpose. But today is live. We're going to be talking about NFA items, machine guns, stupid arbitrary laws that are created to control us and make some people feel safe. I have a false sense of security because they don't understand a thing and that's what makes them scared. Uh, to introduce, I'm Lucas Botkin, the CEO and founder of T-Rex Arms, and I'm joined by my older brother Isaac, who is the chief technical officer. So he does a lot of the, um, how would you describe what you do at T-Rex? I can't describe what I do, but at least Bunch we remember to throw our names out He there does the, the cool videos with all the fun graphics. <laughs> Actually, and it is a fun fact. So the videos that Isaac does with all the cool like, overlays and graphics and stuff, uh, he does all that himself. Uh, we, we don't, I don't do that. And, uh, and apparently I'm too busy to just, help with his videos. Simple. Yeah, so. so like, and then Modern Warfare video, another prime example, he went and cloned all those graphics and gave me all the stuff in After Effects <laughs> so that it would look really fancy. So, um, and then Isaac does a bunch of other stuff as well. But, so today what we want to talk about is obviously unconstitutional laws that infringe on the Second Amendment. Now, well, before I get into this though, I want to explain uh, something that is more sort of foundational and overreaching. Well, so I can, I can actually simplify this whole thing. Okay. The title okay. of this video is Gun Laws and Weapon Systems. Gun Laws Bad, Weapon Systems Good. It's good, yes. We're done. Yeah, so uh, we'll <laughs> see y'all next week. Yeah. Um, so no, so what I want to explain, so obviously in, the, in 2020, we have uh, uh, just a lot of cultural issues, obviously in this country. Uh, we've seen a number of them over the past couple weeks. Uh, but there's a few out there that we deal with here at T-Rex Arms on a day-to-day -day basis and we deal with on social media. Uh, one of them is the idea that select fire weapons, automatic weapons, are somehow inherently evil and horrible and vile and should not be owned by civilians compared to semi-auto. Or that suppressors need some form of regulation or that not everyone should own them. Uh, that SBRs are somehow more dangerous because you can hide them. And there's all these rules out there that people that aren't in the gun community and politicians and other folks don't understand. And I want to explain why that's the case. The reason people are scared of all of these objects here on the table, I think every item here on the table is technically, yes, they're all NFA weapons. We've got select fires, we've got a grenade launcher, we've got all kinds of stuff here. The reason people are scared of regular folks owning these is because of a lack of education and a lack of cultural uh, desensitization. So I was talking to someone on Instagram earlier today who was talking about like, well, I don't just want anyone to own a machine gun because uh, that means you know anyone can have it and could threaten me or you know could be a problem. And I was like, well, okay, are you scared every time you get in the car after 8 p.m. on Friday because you're more likely to be hit by a drunken driver than you are being shot by someone who has a belt-fed machine gun? And he was like, no, that's a that's a bad example, blah blah blah. And I'm like, no no no, it's a good example. You're fine with getting in a car and driving 70 miles an hour to work or on Friday when people are driving around driving drunk because you're used to it. So if you were around machine guns all the time growing up, this would just be a gun that shoots faster. It wouldn't be like this magical unicorn, like just, nuclear uh, bomb, dirty bomb, like whatever. It's a gun that shoots more expensive. It's a gun that shoots more expensive, is more expensive, and has really fast splits. That's it, that's all a machine gun is. But because people are not around these a whole lot, they don't understand them, and people are typically scared of what they don't understand. Like, I am scared of the idea of skydiving because I don't understand how reserve shoots work, you know, how parachuting works in general, uh, what the percentages does. are of how many people die compared to live jumping out of airplanes. Like, I don't know <laughs> that, so I'm a little scared of going and jumping out of airplanes because I don't understand it, I haven't studied it, and I've never done it before. Machine guns and short-barreled guns and grenade launchers and suppressors are very much the same thing. And that's one reason we haven't had politicians trying to fight for our rights because they weren't educated well enough on them growing up. Uh, this, there was a lecture I did at the University of Wyoming where I co covered this in detail and then I spoke about it on uh, the Empty Brass podcast and explained why we're at where we're at today and it's because of a lack of education 30, 40 years ago in this realm. So. Obviously, we have a lot of different items here. I've got a select fire. Well, not really select fire. This is either safe or it's full auto. You can uh, select belt which fed. One you want. Uh, this is an M249 saw. Um, the reason we own these weapons here at T Rex Arms, we're an 0702 uh, front manufacturer. We can manufacture machine guns, possess machine guns, all that stuff. You can Google it. Don't ask us how to become one. Just Google it. There's stuff out there. The reason we own this stuff is precisely for the idea of cultural desensitization. And testing. And testing. And experimentation. And experimenting. But producing content and showing people that these types of items can be used responsibly and they should be owned and used by civilians. They can be owned by civilians. They can be understood by civilians. 
and people just start seeing them more and more. And so what I've told people, they're like, hey, I want to do something to help change perception regarding the NFA or perception re regarding, you know, gun owners rights, or whatever. And I'm like, well, honestly, the first thing to do, go buy a suppressor. If you don't already have one or you, you've already got ARs and stuff, buy a suppressor and start taking it to the range, take it to your indoor range, let people see it. And the more people see suppressors being common use today means we will have a much easier time legalizing them in 10 years. And the other funny thing I want to point out, people love to talk about repealing the NFA, you know, legalizing machine guns, all the stuff. The problem with that idea is it presupposes that's a change that can happen overnight. And the problem is this is all cultural. It does not happen overnight. It, yeah. does, it, it never will happen overnight. It's something that takes decades. Uh, the reason we have so many gun laws on the books right now is because of stuff that wasn't done or was done many, many, many decades ago. So like, I'm not anticipating that this right here will be legal for everyone to own for mm -hmm. It could be 10 to 20 years. I don't know. We also don't know where the country is going to be in that amount of time. And I also will say I find it absolutely disgusting that I can own this gun and you guys can't. Uh, that's something that I every time I go to the range and I'm shooting like I have a select fire uh, Mark 18 MCX and the saw. I'm like, this is really stupid that I can own this because I've done all this stupid arbitrary paperwork with the government. But you guys can't. Um, and that's something that I, I don't see that attitude from very many people in the kind of full auto rental uh, transferable yeah. machine gun world. It's, it gets very elitist where they're like, I have this special item nobody else has. And they don't want to see everything uh, appealed or repealed uh, because then all their value and all their stuff isn't special. Like as I'm soon as everyone has it, it's not special anymore. I'm a little bit sympathetic to that because some people collect old guns that are intrinsically cool sure. and they have value because they are scarce and they are cool and that is very cool and then they have to collect. value because they're transferables there's also guys that collect transferables that are valuable because they're transferables and some of those guys have this attitude of like i need got to protect my investment yeah i don't want to get become illegal because then it goes from thirty thousand dollars to two thousand dollars a frustrating conversation to have with people sometimes yes yes so i'm not a huge fan of that i think people should prioritize uh, freedom and rights over money uh, so what I'm hoping is if we all do our jobs right now for the next 10 to 20 years, whatever more, um, perhaps we can have less regulations uh, when my children are adults and then there are less regulations for their children's children uh, when they're adults and buying guns and stuff like that as well. So this isn't something that's going to happen tomorrow. Sorry, it's not. Yeah. I know thanks to Amazon Prime, you guys want everything tomorrow, uh, but you're not going to see suppressors like being shipped door to door uh, tomorrow. But if we work hard now, potentially it's something we can yeah. start fixing over the next decade. And there are people in the chat saying, well, well, the bill was passed overnight, so it could be repealed overnight. That's technically true from a legal standpoint, but the groundwork in building up the power of the state, the power of the police state, the power of authority, taking that away from people, telling people they don't need to be responsible for things, that happened over a considerable amount of time. Uh, the fact that uh, the NFA and several firearms restrictions happened uh, right after Prohibition and the Great Depression is not an accident. Those things that happened that affected the way that the nation thought about certain things, <clears throat> affected the way they thought about criminals, the way that they thought about government, and really laid the groundwork for that to be uh, politically expedient. So to walk that back, yes, technically it could be done with the stroke of a pen, but the people in power are not going to stroke that pen until after a lot of the cultural ideas have been walked back and people are willing to be more personally responsible and they want to trust trust the government with less uh less oversight less authority uh etc so that that is an important point that's what we're talking about uh the cultural change that exists and the interesting thing is a lot of that cultural change is actually happening right now by accident yeah there was a very cool article uh, Open Source Defense wrote uh, this, this past week talking about how almost every argument that gun control people have been using against uh, the idea of private firearms ownership, all of those arguments that the media has been pushing for years, the media kind of pushed the opposite of that over the last week. So like, why can't you just rely on police? Why can't you just trust the government to take care of these things? Why would you ever need a 30 round mag? Like. So yeah. many of these ideas that the media has been pushing or helping certain people push, um, a lot of those uh, those questions kind of got answered for people who are watching that exact same media. So yeah. it's interesting. It's, and the other interesting thing that I run into online is obviously kind of like I talked about earlier, people are scared of things they don't understand. 
And there's so many people that, like this one guy I was talking to earlier today on Instagram, I was like, well, we, we conversed. And I was like, at the end of it, I was just like, all right, let me get this straight. You want the government to regulate a thing that makes you uncomfortable because it might make you less safe. You literally want the government to come in and regulate this thing you don't like because it, you're uncomfortable with it, is essentially what it comes down to. And the fact of the matter is, I think as, because obviously I think people would agree, we live in soft times, uh, soft times create soft men. But when you have, when you live in a soft time, you're just, you, you, this stuff, this kind of stuff makes you uncomfortable and you start wanting someone else to basically take care of everything for you, i.e. the government. You want them to do everything for you. And the fact of the matter is, life is dangerous. We have it extremely soft here in America, but we can't let that, you know, hide the fact that there's, we have personal responsibility to do certain things. And there's always a chance that there's some chump out there who's going to drink and drive or take a gun and do something stupid or put a bunch of stuff into a crock pot or do something dumb. Like that's always going to exist no matter how civilized your nation is. And I see so many people wanting to try to like put that idea in a box and be like, no, 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 the government will solve that. Like I don't have to worry about my own personal safety, my own personal whatever, my own resiliency as a human being. I want the government to handle this thing for me and I don't want to worry about it. And I think that's a huge problem that obviously crosses over into other aspects of life. Uh, you could probably talk about like health insurance and public education, all these other areas where people are doing that. It's yeah. not just firearms. It's, um, I think it's, it's a problem that is much more widespread than that. But it is interesting because yeah. it goes over into this right here and grenade launchers and stuff like that where it's like, nope, I'm afraid someone's going to take one of those and do a thing. And I'm like, so because you're afraid that this thing might happen, you want to punish everyone and you don't want anyone else to be able to have this thing that they may need for certain reasons. Well, and let's talk about that for a oh, second boy. because gun laws do tend to punish the innocent. So yep. murder is a crime. Murder is a very serious capital Indeed. crime. Murderers need to receive justice. <clears throat> What generally happens, though, is you'll see a terrible, uh, usually a mass murder get committed, and then that murderer may get caught or he may commit suicide, but then there's a bunch of laws that punish uh, not that guy, uh, but people who own certain things. So yep. this is something Absolutely. that just happened in Canada recently. Uh, we don't pay a huge amount of attention to what is happening in Canada. It's not that we don't care about the freedoms that you guys should have. It's just that... There's a lot happening here, and it's hard to keep track. There are some really good lawsuits apparently pushing back oh, against good. that recent ban. Um, but I, I don't keep up with those as well as uh, I do some other stuff. But this idea that a situation happens and is dangerous, let's go after uh, everybody, not the perpetrator. So even when it comes to things like some of the recent riots, regardless of how legitimate the initial protests are, there are some illegitimate, destructive, riotous things happening. And rather than go out and directly focus on the people who are committing arson or who are, who are committing robbery or vandalism or whatever, a lot of cities just instituted curfews. Curfews that will limit the freedoms of everybody. That will limit the freedoms of people who were completely innocent, the people who actually had legitimate grievances that they wanted to uh, gather to remonstrate with the government about. Um, and, and gun laws are this exact same thing. There's so many, there's so many areas where the government f finds that they... The opportunity to take more control and not deal with the really annoying, problematic thing to deal with, uh, they usually just take the, we have more control uh, option and that's our excuse for not dealing with whatever. The temptation is always going to be there for people to take the easy option. And somehow in our culture, we've created this idea where going after the law-abiding citizens uh, is the easier option, creating more giant laws that affect entire uh portions of the demographic like the that had nothing ban. to do with the issue, like the bump stock ban, yep. um, that has just kind Thank of become President the Trump. norm uh, for our politicians on both sides of the aisle. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Since I was uh, President Trump, totally did all that. He's instituted more firearms regulation uh, than Obama ever did. Fun fact. Yeah. So actually. this is a very interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Trump is uh, a one of a kind person. Uh, yeah. he's, he's an outlier in kind of like uh, Elon Musk. Yes. Yeah. He's definitely an outlier. But one of the things that you see a lot of the time is when the Democrats are in power, they're actually pretty quiet about gun control legislation. And then when the Republicans are in power, they are extremely vocal about it. The Democrats do not actually want to pass gun control. They want to force the Republicans to do it because that's actually far more effective. Uh, for a number of reasons. So, so interesting. There's a point I want to bring up, and I see this thrown a lot around a lot. People go, well, because of the Second Amendment, I get to own whatever I want. 
and they wave the Second Amendment as this flag for owning whatever hobby item they want, while they completely disregard what the intent of the Second Amendment is, which is personal responsibility to God and country and fighting mm-hmm. foreign governments that could invade your own land or fighting a domestic government that becomes tyrannical. Um, so I see that thrown around a lot for like belt feds where people are like, the Second Amendment allows me to own whatever I want. I want a belt fed. And I'm like, well, if you're going to use the Second Am- Amendment as an argument, which, hey, cool, you also need to understand what the Second Amendment is for. Because yeah. usually those exact same people go, oh, like being prepared for the worst or tyranny or understanding, you know, rules of engagement and X, Y, Z, all this. No, I don't want that. I just want to own a belt fed for fun. And I'm like, well, then don't use the Second Amendment as an argument. Just say you want it for a hobby item and it's not actually for the intended purpose of the Second Amendment. So that's a that's a yeah. thing that I see a lot on social media. It's just thrown around as a, um, I got, what's a, what's a... It's just sort of a catch-all. Or yeah. Like, well, here's... It's kind of a... And it's frustrating. Because of this, when, I can have whatever I want. It's kind of frustrating to to see our side do that because it's exactly what yeah. the other side says. The other side says, because this shooting happened or because this dangerous thing might happen, everything comes off the table. And yep. so for... For our side to be equally sloppy and say, well, because our arguments are Second Amendment and hunting and my rights and whatever, I'm just going to lump all those in together and just do whatever. No, we need to actually be be really honest about why we have certain rights. They're not important just because they they are. There's a reason for that. They're not important just because they're a thing that our country did. They're not important just because they're a thing your granddaddy did. There has to be an intrinsic value to them, and and the intrinsic value and purpose of the Second Amendment is so that the people are armed for the purpose of holding their own government in check Mm -hmm. and defending their country from other governments. Are there other Mm -hmm. reasons to own guns? Absolutely. Are there other good reasons to own guns? Absolutely. But the Second Amendment has a very express purpose, and when you are sloppy about what it's for, don't be surprised when... Anti-gun politicians are super sloppy about what the Second Amendment is for. I've heard so many Democratic oh, yeah. politicians and Republican politicians talk about, Big time. Sec- I'm a huge Second Amendment supporter, but I really think that you only need three bullets to hunt a deer. You know what? That's just not the Second Amendment, guys. <laughs> anyway, this one of the questions. and more. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask, um, Kind of in light of this, kind of in light of let's be responsible and let's be practical. Practical. Some people have asked, like, if the Second Amendment uh, were reinstated in full force, mm-hmm. oh wait, it, it actually still is on the books. Let's say that the uh, all firearm regulations went away tomorrow and you could own literally whatever anything, you want, anything, tow missiles. What would you actually do? Um, to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do a whole lot differently. I, I it's not either. just because I uh, have access to cool SOT yeah. stuff. It's because a lot of this stuff is actually very impractical for, for an individual to own. For an individual to so, own. So yeah. So let's talk about it real quick. So this especially is, the belt. Yeah. There's this idea that like, hey, let's say full auto becomes legal tomorrow. Suppressors. I think we would see suppressor prices probably would drop. There's obviously some cans out there. They're already five hundred dollars each. Um, I think a lot of the yeah. premium cans would start to come down. You know, 800, four, there'd be a bunch of, a lot of new companies would start. There'd be mm-hmm. some new innovation because there'd be less regulation. That'd be pretty cool. A lot of suppressor technology, a lot of the development has been make the can last a really, really long time because, because of it's all such these a laws. pain to get. Yeah, versus away, dollar cans that I can buy would, five of. Yeah, people would experiment with other technologies that are can related. Yeah, so basically there's this idea that if all of a sudden this became legal, this would be $500 and you could buy it in the vending machine. And the answer to that is, well, we run a manufacturing company. We don't make anything crazy, fancy, or cool. We make holsters. But knowing how manufacturing works to some level, this gun would never be $500. Uh, the semi-auto version of this, which is how this gun originally started, uh, cost me $7,900. 7, I got it for a deal. It's about $8,500. So let's say, for whatever reason, auto was repealed and legal tomorrow. FN wouldn't just all of a sudden start selling you know, full auto belt feds off to gun stores for you know $1,000 a pop. These would probably end up being about ten grand. They may yeah. even make them more expensive just because the supply and demand and more people yeah. are wanting them. They're like, well, fine, we'll sell them for $14,000. So, so here's an interesting point that someone in the chat made. Oh, yeah? Or okay. the email. The email oh, is yeah. actually where the good yeah. points get made. Big roast. Uh, but uh, basically, he made the point that 50 BMG is very similar to this. 50 BMG is yeah. not 
actually regulated, except in some states like California. Yep. But the rifles Fair are really entry. expensive just because I'm going back there. they're it's a hard thing to build. Yeah. And the ammo is going to be it's like expensive 10 grand. because it's a an awful lot of material that goes into that yeah. ammo. Even if 50 BMG sold as many rounds as 556, five, it would still be way yeah. more expensive there's, just because of how big and complicated there's it is. There's definitely, and so, and I see this argument thrown out where it's like, well, if machine guns are legal, any hoo-ha can go and buy them. And I'm like, well, generally hoo-hahs don't have 12 grand they can fork over. Like, they've probably got to be working a pretty decent job and be pretty financially responsible. So they're probably not a hoo-ha to Who go out and buy one of these. Who are hoo-hahs? I don't know. Okay. We'll let the chat answer that. But no, kind of what that. I'm getting at is there is a barrier to entry when you start getting into stuff like tanks and air support, uh, crew served weapons. Like there's so much cost associated with those. The only people that could really buy them are people who are really serious about this stuff who are pooling their resources. So here's here's let's say this became legal tomorrow. Would I own one of these personally myself? No. I would still run a regular AR as my main gun, and maybe I'd buy a standalone grenade launcher and some high explosive grenades, because that would probably be a little more effective than having one of these. Now, if I have a group of friends, I got five buddies, and I'm like, you know what? Yep. We're a little squad. You should probably have a uh, belt fed of some sort, a maybe squad, 308. automatic weapon. You should have a 240 Bravo or something. We'd pool our money. It would be about probably $14,000, more or less. So we all pool three, four grand, and now we have a belt fed we can kind of trade around and ha hang on to as a squad, as a group of individuals. So that's mm -hmm. where something like this becomes more practical if it were to become legal. Um, but like for the average gun owner, you know, I would still recommend, if everything were legal, I'd still recommend standard AR-15 yep. with a 10 and a half to 14 and a half, 16 inch barrel, doesn't really matter much depending on what you're doing. And then a suppressor on it is absolutely, suppressors are totally awesome. Um, if the gun select fire, that's cool. If it's not, that's fine. Get a Geisley trigger, you're good to go. And that's the gun. Uh, the only yeah. thing I would probably add is some sort of explosive capability, handheld of some sort, or flashbangs. Uh, but I wouldn't just go out and buy one of these even if it were legal and I could, because that's yeah. a lot of money, you know? And like, even though I can take this to the range whenever I want, I'm not gonna be shooting this all the time because, well, the am it burns through ammo a lot. Uh, the kinds of reps I can get with this gun are not as efficient compared to the reps I'm getting with a standard AR because I teach people how to shoot regular ARs. I don't teach belt fed classes, although a lot of the fundamentals are the same, target transitioning, yeah. movement, stuff like that. But um, that's something that I think a lot of people don't understand. They don't understand or they don't think about what America would actually look like were this all to be legal. Uh, you wouldn't see people running around strapping tow missile launchers to their forerunners. Because uh, I think a tow missile is like, a, a missile on its own is like $200,000. So the launching system is many millions of dollars. Uh, and the you guidance just, system is you've a got, pain. And then you have the company. So that's the other thing. Like, Trying FN, to drive that thing in on the spiral is hard. Yeah, but like you have companies like, let's say machine guns were legal. FN probably wouldn't just sell to anyone. They would probably pick a dealer to sell to. And that dealer would probably ask for certain paperwork or some form of, what are you using this gun for? Uh, a lot of folks think that these companies are just going to sell to anyone. And yeah, there's companies like, you know, maybe a g certain German company that do that. Uh, but not every company out here would just be like, oh, let's make all of our guns full auto and sell them to anyone. And let's uh, make a cheapo belt fed. We can sell to anyone. Like, no, not every company would actually go out and do that. Most of them would still try to be at least know where the sales are going, know where their hardware is going, um, be you know somewhat cautious depending on where they're selling to and what's going on. It wouldn't just turn into this massive like free-for-all where they're selling guns anywhere. But also, let's face it, the laws are only affecting the law-abiding. Criminals can go and modify or build or create or buy on the black market whatever they want. If they want to get explosives, they can. If they want to make an AR full auto, they can. Uh, the laws are only affecting you guys and me and the only reason I can own this is I went and jumped through a ton of paperwork and hoops and whatnot, and the ATF can raid me at any moment and check on all my logs and paperwork and see if I'm good to go with all this stuff and it's papered accordingly. Stupid. It's dumb. But it does mean I can own this and you can't, and I think that's horrible and disgusting. And one of the so. lessons that we've learned from owning it is it's a pain to own it. Yeah. And it's only useful if you do, in fact, have a squad and you actually are doing the squad stuff. Otherwise, I mean, I guess it could be a hobby gun. There's some guys who yeah, would decide, yeah. would they like to own this or a Harley Davidson? Yeah. Harley Davidson's yeah. technically more expensive. I'd rather own this. I've got a, I have a buddy who went and got yeah. a saw, semi-auto, just because he wanted to run reps with it. He was issued one. And 
He, it wasn't, it's not the most practical gun to own semi, definitely not, it's a heavy AR. He wanted one just to get reps in and it's fun and it's, you know, it's different. It's not shooting an AR, which does get a little boring if you shoot a lot and he does. Um, so there is that, but I think a lot of people, for they don't want to see past the idea of, well, if full auto is legal, every gun will be full auto and it'll be the wild west and everyone will be hosing and blasting everywhere. And it's like, well, no, because people aren't doing that with semi-auto why would all of a sudden an extra selecting selector level all of a sudden turn everyone into crazed zombies well it wouldn't actually so it's kind of funny same with carry permits if carry permits were to be dismissed uh we wouldn't just see wild west town and i think carry permits are probably one of the biggest uh infringements on the second amendment that we have that people forget usually because people are over 21 by the time they decide to carry a gun uh but what they don't realize is to get a carry permit, you are having to ask permission and pay money to We're the government to then get a to permit. Deal with that. We're trying to deal yeah. with that here in Tennessee. By it's the way, problem. let us know if you're interested in uh, updates on the political process and political lobbying stuff we've been trying to do. Um, spoiler alert, everything is kind of messed up in 2020. Uh, so we didn't get as much done as we had hoped. But one area where select fire and no laws would probably make a major difference is uh, these little PDW type yeah. things. Um, That's a right two-stamp now, gun, stupid. Right now, this is kind of a pain, difficult, expensive, and it's fairly like impractical. Grand, seven but, grand right there, stupid. Yeah, but once you actually um, get rid of some of the laws and you can do things like, I some don't of know, the stuff put a cheaper, vertical grip. Somewhat. Well, I forgot this thing's in the way. Once you put a vertical <laughs> grip on here, that becomes a thing that gets yeah, in yeah. an awful lot of trouble, and so people don't do that. But if you could actually let the free market see what people are looking for and what's practical, I think that that would be cool. That this not practical. Not this is practical for like one thing, but jump shots. Yeah, you can go to prison over this if you have a shotgun that's too short for some stupid reason. Well, worst can happen to you. But have but a yeah. have a look at that Maxim right there. So that's oh, yeah. a yeah. super cool thing that I don't think is selling super well because it's complicated. Built-in yeah. suppressor and uh, a fairly cool modern this uh, this would have sold invention. this would have sold times 10 had people been able to buy these yeah. without doing stupid paperwork uh they would have at silencer co would still be in business i think they're, they're technically still in business oh, but yeah. they yeah. they took a massive hit after releasing this and a few other products uh silencer co would be doing very well i would not have laid off uh, a bunch of employees had there not been a ton of stupid stupid paperwork because this is a one stamp gun so you have to have a trust or file this individually uh, pay two hundred dollars. So this was, I think, twelve hundred MSRP plus two hundred plus a huge weight like that plus a massive weight at the time when this yeah. was released. It was like a year. Uh, because of that people didn't buy it. I looked at it and was like, I don't want to wait, wait a year for that. I'm not going to sit on this money and pay it and not have it for a year. I'm not going to buy it. But so I didn't I buy it because one. of that. You wanted one. We finally got one. Uh, Silencer <laughs> Co. took a big hit. Had to lay off a lot of people. I think the owner, Josh, may have gone somewhere else. Um, but, uh, it's all because of the stupid regulations preventing Americans from doing their jobs and, uh, keeping their jobs and doing things. And, uh, not just Americans. So. Do you know the other news from this week? You might not have no, heard this, no. but SIG Germany is going away. Oh, and yeah. it's based oh cause on... of all the regulations in Germany. Yeah. Uh, actually, no, not German regulations. EU? These are EU regulations oh, because worse. SIG Germany worse. and SIG US are... Uh, on the camera, they're actually over here. Because they are actually working together and sharing designs, the new EU mm -hmm. rules say that anyone who's building military weapons for countries within the EU can't be doing a certain amount of business with America. So that means that SIG Germany, uh, not actually have a SIG to point to, SIG Germany can no longer oh, make stuff. MCH. Oh yeah. They can no longer make stuff for EU military or police contracts. And that's pretty much the only people that you make guns for inside of the EU, since it's very difficult for civilians to get them. So that's kind of the end of their business plan. That's kind of the end of their business model. And it is, it's frustrating to see that. I'm not the world's biggest SIG fan, but it is incredibly frustrating to see that yeah. the regulations, and I don't understand exactly how it happened, because Germany has a ton of clout in the EU, and Germany allowed these laws to basically shut down uh, well, a very a very cool uh, firearm uh, company. And this is a very important thing that, that happens when you pass these regulations. They yep. have unintended consequences. I actually wonder if this wasn't kind of an unintended consequence, but this kind of idea that controls not just the tools that civilians have, but also the way that whole industries work. It sets into place this idea that 
Well, the EU will protect its own free market by making the market less free. EU is going to protect its own free citizens by making them less free. It's exactly what's happening uh, here in the United States. And it has tremendously problematic consequences in the long term, even if it promises nice benefits in the short term. Yeah, do you have any other questions to uh, go, go over? Oh, well, there's a lot of people who have asked sort of practical questions about weapon systems like 22 conversion bolts for uh, AR-15s for practice and reps and stuff. They were great back when the ammo was two cents a round uh, six years ago. Now that it's like nine cents a round, I think it's better to just go straight to 5.56. Five, yeah, but 5.56 five, five, is more expensive too. Only twice. You yeah. can get wolf for 18 cents, 19. Well, not right now. Let's fast forward to when things get back to normal. And when is that though? A few months, probably at least. Then. We'll see. A few It'll months. We'll see. Sometime few months. after the election. At uh, Possibly well, after yeah. the so next election. Let's say if ammo comes back in three months, it'll then go away again as soon as the election hits. But yeah. when ammo comes back, Wolf 223, 556, yeah. or Tula, uh, if you, you know, if you want to get one of those, or Wolf Gold, uh, not Wolf Gold, um, well, you can get Wolf Gold. You're looking at 20 to 27 cents a round, something like that. So at that point, I'm like, just skip 22 because it's like nine, 10 cents a round, um, unless you've got a source yeah. that's awesome. And just go straight to big boy round and just shoot two, two, three, five, five, six. It's yeah. got a little more recoil. If things get weird, uh, you have a more effective round than stockpiling a bunch of 22. Uh, like I don't own a single 22 gun. Uh, the only 22 gun I want to own would be a little Ruger suppressed with a red dot and a X300 vampire. It's probably the most fun gun to shoot actually is one of those little Ruger pistols. Hmm. Why don't we have one? Wait, David has one. I have one. I was just why do I, why, do, sure why don't I have one? I run around with this, and I don't ever. <laughs> well, see, practical guns are kind of more of yeah. where I'm at well, because I uh, yes. But yeah, I'm little suppressed, person. little suppressed twenty two pistol with a three hundred dollars suppressor, totally awesome. Twenty two rifle 22. for small children, also totally also awesome. Also awesome. Uh, twenty two for me, uh, no, I uh, don't need to shoot twenty two rifles. I don't need to shoot ten twenty six, ten twenty twos. I also ten twenty sixes. There's a limit uh, to how cheap stuff yeah before it gets really it was worth it. it was great when it was two cents around that was back when i was shooting a lot of 22 with a conversion bolt but that was six no seven eight years ago yeah that was like eight years ago before i yeah. got all this started um and that was like you could buy a brick of 550 for cheap like 20 bucks 20 or whatever cents, it was yeah. yeah uh for a case of it so i was shooting a brick of those like not every week, but also my training wasn't that good. I was literally just planking and doing dumb stuff. Getting reps in with an AR, but basically doing dumb stuff. Uh, I would say don't even bother with 22 conversion bolts uh, right now unless yeah. the ammo really comes down. Another That's thing my that, opinion. Another least. thing that I, I would say is uh, I, I agree with that. Think about your weapon system kind of as a whole. This is something that a lot of people don't do. They pick a cool round or they pick a cool gun and they don't really think about the whole weapon system, which goes back to what we were talking about before regarding the Second Amendment and the responsibilities that come with it. Are you doing this as a hobby or do you actually want to have some practical defense capability? And so, so give that some thought. And for example, this right here is a very problematic weapon system unless it's a, it is a support system for a larger system which also supports it. Um, you know, one of my favorite weapon systems It could be anything, honestly. Okay, okay. Well, you're not going G11? to like it is my favorite uh, ancient clockwork German uh, uber-complicated assembly. But my favorite weapon system is from Belgium. Uh, it is the P90 5.7 pistol, the 5.7 round, and the requirements that they built it for. That is super cool. However, cool. Yes. if you get outside of those requirements, it makes less sense. Any one of those pieces makes less sense. So yeah. when you have something like the P90 and you bring it over here to America and it is no longer select fire, it no longer has armor piercing ammo, and it's no longer small and compact because it has to have a 16 inch barrel. barrel. And then you take it to California where the 50 round magazine capacity is now 10, and changing it's those mags is useless no fun. innovation, useless gun. It, it becomes 100%. super lame. But if you are an anti terrorist guy and you need a super tiny gun and you need high round count and you need the the PDW the and the pistol ammo. to share ammo yep. because that's the budget requirements tip. that you are under. The system is cool, yeah. but the parts by themselves are less cool. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I was actually thinking about the other day. I was pricing uh, AR-10 setups, oh, and I fine. was reading so, about the difference between 6.5 and oh, 308. Yeah, I'm, I'm building a 6.5 soon. So 6.5 is super actually. cool. And you do you. 
But I was like, how can I justify 6-5 when the 308 yeah, Winchester or uh, well, 7 6, six, six five is cool because you can get training ammo for 50 cents a round, so it ends up being about the same, which is great. Um, I think it will be a more expensive... Uh, the barrels probably aren't that much more expensive. I don't know. I'm building something unique. It's yes. going to need a bunch and, of custom stuff and done building to it. something unique. Six That's five, cool. two of them. As cool and as but, awesome as building something unique is, as much as I want to. The fact is, I'm yeah. probably going to. If I ever do this project, it'll be 308. In the same way that 300 Blackout is super awesome. I don't have one. My shorty bag gun is 556. Five, ah, this uh, is a new 300 that I'm playing with. Uh, I know it's super cool. I'm not talking about Double down. stamps, stupid, um, <laughs> that you have to do paperwork to put this thing on it and then have, have it this thing, but... This is a little seven and a half inch, uh, or no, it's an eight inch uh, Seekins barrel. And uh, I shoot a lot of 300 Blackout. The other gun that I shoot a lot is a MCX Virtus uh, with a nine inch barrel. And then I have a rail that goes over the can. It's all fancy and stuff. But the only other thing this gun really needs is a law folder because uh, mm -hmm, that'll yeah. drop the stock all the way to here. And this guy should fit in a bag that's 24 inches, I want to say 24 inches uh, tall. A Vertex um, bag? With the can on it. Uh, well, whoever. Uh, probably 26 actually, 26 inch bag. Okay. I measured all my guns recently to figure out like what kind of bags I would need and um, most of my guns need a 30 inch bag and like nobody makes that. It's all like 26.7 or like 28 or something so a lot of my guns don't fit. And, and then it gets huge and it's stupid like the, the way the bag sizing works for certain guns. Like if I want to run that 416 I can't. Uh, the MP5, even with this with the can on, although the nice thing with this is it is easy to remove the can um, if it has a tri lug. Um, so I actually could run this in a bag on its own um, pretty easily. And this is a much shorter bag, obviously, and that's where like a little PDW gun comes in handy. Although, um, but I a will, blackout. Makes I will a lot point more sense. out one of the things that I think we've seen a lot of advantages uh, over time. The 300 blackout round is a very cool round. You can make a 300 blackout gun that's not a whole lot smaller than this MP5, which makes the yeah. MP5 make a little bit less sense yep. and make something that's like a modern Uzi make a little bit more sense. Yep. And uh, so these are some things that we probably see more people. Obviously, there's uh, there's people who are allowed to have this stuff experimenting mm -hmm. with yeah. it, but the free market would allow us to experiment some more. Yeah. Like, uh, I can't believe we didn't mention already, the, uh, the pistol braces. Oh yes, why don't you yeah, cover that. The pistol oh. braces are very cool. We don't have one on the table because we specifically got NFA items, but a short barreled rifle is an NFA item. We got some back there somewhere. Uh, but the pistol brace was actually classified as not a stock, so people could build short barreled AR pistols with something like unto a stock, and that yeah. actually had a massive and like an unbelievably huge impact on the industry and on the community and what people were actually able to do, the capabilities that they had. It was tremendous. Mm -hmm. And all that was was a little loophole to create an opportunity to do a thing. Um, removing some of these restrictions, I think, would be very interesting. But, the, cool, uh, the cool thing, so the company that really made that happen, um, or at least really improved on it, was obviously SB Tactical. Uh, when I was getting into guns, I specifically was not going with short barrels because there was not a good way at the time, six years ago, to have... People were doing like the soft pads that go onto the buffer tubes like you would have in Call of Duty if you select no stock. Um, but that's not very effective. So I stayed away from short barrels completely because there was no good way of actually shooting with one uh, until uh, SB made their big like uh, circular one for SIG. Um, I actually got one of those and used that. And then later on the A3 was developed and that was a stock essentially, more or less. Um, and then that allowed basically the exact amount of shooting performance that you would get out of a normal stock unless you have to go and uh, mortar around. That's really the only issue. Yeah. But the cool thing with SB, they've sold hundreds of thousands of these things. And I've, we've talked to them a number of times and they're like, honestly, if it could all go away tomorrow, we'd be fine with that. Yep. Technically, it would make all their products obsolete except for a few states where people can't have like SBRs or maybe, you know, states like uh, Illinois or California still kept their restrictions on the books. Uh, but SB said, nope, we'd be 100% fine with that. And the thing is, oh, well, here's what's really sad. There's very few companies in the gun industry who have uh, have those feelings where they prioritize the community or freedom over just making a buck mm -hmm. off yeah. of the current circumstances. And that's probably 
the most uh, disheartening thing that I've learned over the past six years being in the industry. There are so many people that'll say stuff like, well, we have to have an antithesis. We have to have some form of gun laws so that we can have uh, massive runs on guns whenever something happens and make a lot of money. We've got to have this sort of thing over here so that we can have, we can make this product specifically for this loophole. We have to have this thing so we can do this and make money and sell a product and blah, 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 blah. And it's always really cool to find a company like SB who's like, nope, if it could all go away tomorrow, we'd be fine with that. And they've told me we would just figure out something else to do. Yeah. We'd stop selling braces because they wouldn't be necessary and we would just go and design another product. And they're cool with that. And I think mm -hmm. that's awesome. There's very few companies that think that way. Um, I've only met, I've met a few machine gun owners that think that way. I've also met a few of the cloner machine gun guys who they like being special owning these, um, you know, and so there's the peasants, then there's guys who own these. Um, and I just find that really disingenuous to the second amendment, very disingenuous to you guys. And I think it's something that um, we should, well, I think it's a, it's a moral issue more than anything uh, where they are like, oh, I can be on a pedestal while everyone else isn't. And I don't want to see this freedom restored to people. And I just think that's super anti-American. Well, it's a um, discouraging attitude. I, I will say absolutely. that one fascinating thing about the prevalence of the pistol braces on and ARs. And constitutional, yes. It means that there are a ton of short-barreled AR-15s floating around, and it has not adversely affected crime. Or maybe it has adversely affected crime. Let me say that. It hasn't caused more crime. <laughs> crime has gone down. Has it negatively affected Yeah, we didn't see this massive yeah. like wave of like firearms deaths by AR pistols in the 10.5 variety now that there's more short-barreled uh, weapons on the market. Yeah, Funny hands, how that works, hands and actually. Feet. Hands hmm. and feet still kill more people. But this yeah. is a very interesting thing that happened. We had a... A loophole opened up. It was massively uh, utilized by many people, and it actually allowed them to sidestep a couple of other things. There's a bunch of uh, states and cities where you are not allowed to conceal a rifle, you're not allowed to carry a rifle, you're not allowed to carry a loaded rifle, and because these things were technically pistols, there were a lot more people not only owning these very small, concealable, dangerous, deadly things, but also, presumably, uh, carrying them more places and there weren't a gazillion massacres with them. So the, uh, the, the reasons that uh, the various uh, lawmakers gave for implementing the NFA in the first place, uh, making sure that short-barreled shotguns and short-barreled rifles were not owned by the public because of the extreme danger and damage that they would, uh, that they would cause, that turns out to not be a thing. Um, we knew that that wasn't really a thing, but turns out it's not actually a thing. So, yeah, so I think that if we could... Uh, repeal some of these restrictions, we would probably see some very cool uh, oh, advantages Tons. being taken by the industry in the same way that we saw with, uh, with that brace. Um, the invention of the brace was not actually that big of a technological breakthrough, but the way that they actually got the paperwork done, established yep. it, and sold it uh, was fantastic. Tremendous for the community. Uh, does a lot of folders still work for pistols with length of pull required? There's a lot of gray area, and this is the really stupid part because the ATF goes back and forth. But I will say, the last thing you should do is ever email the ATF asking for them to give an opinion. That's how we get stupid rules. Stop asking. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of questions about like length of poles it measured with the stock folded, unfolded, vertical grips. What if it's not vertical? Blah, blah, blah. Like, the answer is, a lot of that stuff, nobody actually knows. The ATF, it bounces back and forth on it. You could call one field office. They say it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You could call one that says that it does. Um, there's a lot of stuff in that realm of air pistol stuff that just people don't know. But don't email them. You look around on forums. I don't know exactly what the current status is on certain rulings that they're doing. I don't do a lot of stuff with air pistols anymore. I've got... Uh, my main 300 blackout is an air pistol. I take it across state lines all the time. So technically, I don't have to file Form 20 because with SBR, technically, you have to do that. Um, and that's got a 9-inch barrel. Uh, I have no, I don't have a grip on it. I do have a folding stock, and then I have a suppressor on it. Um, and so I believe that meets all the requirements of being an air pistol, I believe, unless they've changed something in the past few months. Um, but as far as all those questions go, go ahead and Google them on forums and see what people are saying, but don't write to the ATF. Like, don't. Yeah. Just don't do that. So this Please is a thing that, that. <laughs> a lot of regulatory agencies, um, they get handed law, legal code, but then they interpret it just kind of off the top of their heads and it's different yeah. from one field office to another and this causes problematic issues. Yeah. That's not the sort of thing that they should be allowed to do. Technically, our laws should not be so complicated that that's necessary. Uh, our laws should not be millions and millions and millions of lines of code. I did an estimate 
Uh, I think Tennessee has 2 million lines of code right now in our criminal code. Yeah. Like our ATF guy who came in and helped us get set up with all of our FFL stuff, he was cool. I don't know where he stands on certain things, but that's probably a very different, uh, you know, he's probably very different from one down up in New York, you know, or over in California or something like that. So it varies a lot. And then if they want to get you on something, they'll figure a way or someone will. Um, so it is really tricky. I, it's, it's really stupid, but it's really hard to be 100% legal in America nowadays. Like we all break multiple laws a day somehow in some form, in some way. And when you have just regular folks going about their lives, not affecting other people, but they're somehow arbitrarily breaking the law every day, that's when you know your justice system is pretty messed up. So... I'm not a big no. fan of that. Our entire justice system needs a, a huge rework at some point. It does. And one of the original <laughs> ideas behind the founding of the country would be we would have 50 states that would have a tremendous amount of freedom to govern their own people, and the federal government would do very, very little. It would only protect the rights of those people uh, from the government, essentially. And uh, we've kind of gotten away from that. And one of the things that oh, that's amazing. I think it was pretty obvious for a ton of people uh, during you know, way back when, like a, a month ago, remember when, when uh, coronavirus was a major disaster? Mm -hmm. It's cured now. I'm not going to yeah. say what cured it, but uh, it involved massive protests, Mazel Tov cocktails, according to ABC. Uh, but one of the things that became apparent is that different parts of the country require different requirements in different situations. And so having a giant blanket federal law for Podunk, Tennessee, and the busiest part of Manhattan is kind of crazy, um, especially when the people that live there not only need different levels of government, uh, but also want different levels of government and are doing completely different things. So that is something that we can talk yeah. more about. Do you have any other Later questions on. we need oh. hit before we go? The people are making questions. statements, defund the ATF, absolutely. Uh, get rid of them, absolutely, 100%. Um. The ATF is, the ATF is uh, yeah. Yeah, big there, problems. We have, we have a lot of agencies, big enforcement big. agencies, that have the ability to, they don't have the ability to write law, because that is a legislative body thing, but they have so much leeway in the way that they interpret the law, it is hugely problematic. What's um, your opinion on 3D printed AR lowers? Many are designed and made to retaliate or prove the futility of federal rule over firearms. You can talk about that more. You did a video on that, actually, I think, on 3D printing guns. Well, I mentioned how awesome it is that it is possible, loophole. and I mentioned that it is not. So, so here's it's another thing about right firearm now. laws. There's a little thing called um, constructive possession, I believe, in which case if you own two things that are perfectly legal, but if they are two things that can be put together in a way to create a thing that is so illegal, a, a that's a problem. So a stick with a rock, and you put it together into a club, and then... Well, clubs uh, are not banned, but here's the thing. If there is iron ore in our backyard, and we could turn it into steel, and then we have a milling machine that could turn that steel into an AR lower, is that constructive or if i have radioactive material and then steel i can basically make a nuke right is that how it works that's basically how it works right it's like minecraft mm -hmm. logic yeah, I basically so. you just find some plutonium and then find metal and i'm just like well and nuke and that argument i mean not that exact argument <laughs> but that kind of argument is being used to say the plans for guns must also be restricted they cannot be published they cannot be disseminated because the plans for guns uh, are things that could be used to make an actual gun, and an actual gun could be used to commit an actual crime. And that's a couple steps that's away all, from being actually of, guilty of an actual crime. That sounds like Minority Report. It's very uh, Minority sounds Report esque. Like Red Flag um, Laws. Yeah. And, and in some ways, it's sounds actually good. worse than Minority Report, because at least yeah. in Minority Report, they were like, we think you're going to commit an actual crime. And this is like, we think that you having the ability to you potentially may commit a crime. Potentially do yeah. it because of these books that you have. Just you having the ability is a problem. And that's where the discussion on 3D uh, printed firearms is. Is uh, Generally, um, the discussion is these plans will allow people to own items which could potentially cause problems. That's a problem. We need to get rid of 3D printers. We need to get rid of 3D files. We need to get yeah. rid of all of the tools that you could use to make a gun, which, I mean... To be honest, even though we're a really simple manufacturing shop and we mostly bend plastic, so many of the tools in the shop could be used to make firearms. Everything could be a weapon. Everything so could be a weapon. And the fun, here's the funny thing. This is the hilarious... Oh, I got to set something straight real quick. I don't play Minecraft. But moving on. Um, the, really, the really funny thing... It is. People were saying that. Um, the funny thing is people think that like machine guns, like this right here, is like the way. 
to kill a lot of people. And it's like, no, there's there's way more effective ways at actually like getting a body count. Guns, while as effective as they are for certain things, are not that effective. Uh, they're extremely targeted. You have to actually be somewhat proficient with them uh, to actually do certain things. But there's a lot of other ways you can kill a lot of other people and actually harm society with stuff you can go out and already buy. Like guns are, the reason people see guns as like the thing for killing is because the media talks about that all the time. It's because they see in movies all the time. They don't see movies necessarily about you know, uh, making crazy bombs or driving, like obviously in Europe, what we saw were guys jumping in trucks and just running into people and killing dozens of people. Uh, we saw that a number of times and there's other things that could have well, and added like to, to that scenario to actually kill even more people, well, more than people, probably a gun would. Some people were talking about that and they were like, well, the only reason they had to use a truck is because they couldn't buy guns in those countries. However, the amount of illegal guns that are constantly being found in London and there's, London there's alone in certain uh, kinds of guns prove that yeah. those guys probably could have got guns. It's actually pretty easy to get illegal yeah. stuff. But and you know what's kind of fun? Vehicles are also disguised in society. You can drive around and all of a sudden make it a weapon sure. immediately. Like they have a lot of tactical advantages to being used as a weapon. I will say but. one of the things that is kind of fun about the... Uh, the underground uh, European firearms trade is because everything is technically illegal. Almost everything that gets made is a fully automatic sub gun with a silencer on it because why not? <laughs> and that is something that is very interesting that is happening over there. Um, someone is asking about uh, 762 by 39 cans. You have one. Um, well, I've got 7.62 cans. Um, I shoot, I actually don't shoot 7.62 by 39 at all. I don't even own a single gun that shoots it. I've got 5.45 guns, uh, like that one up there. You can't really see it. It's a crank, it's a press crank up there. Um, but I believe any 30 caliber can, you're going to be able to run that ammo. Yep. Should be good to go. Um, but I don't know what cans are optimized for that particular cartridge as far as like blowback and gas and all that good stuff. I have a dead air Wolverine on this crank, uh, which is obviously basically a clone Russian suppressor. Um, I don't believe they make that for 7.62x39. They may, uh, not sure. Um, but I'm not, I haven't run a ton of different, I mean, let's see, I have a few. I've got a dead air, a surefire, a BNT. Um, I haven't run enough cans out there to really sit people down and be like, get this one. Like, this is the one you should get out of trying all these different suppressors. Um, now that we have an SOT, I actually, and we talked about it on your suppressor video, I actually do want to go out and buy, like, each company's 5.56 can, like their main 5.56 yeah. can. Uh, we recently built five Mark 18s. Uh, a couple of them got used for different shoots, but those are going to be test guns, more or less, for these suppressors. Uh, so they're all the same. They all got the same gas port. They all got the same everything. So I want to try like a dead air, an OSS. I've already tried Surefires a lot. Um, I already have one that has a Surefire on it. I'll basically try out a bunch of these main 5.56 cans and their muzzle devices and actually see what's going on. And then obviously break down price because, you know, you got NT4s that are $1,600, like this one right here. Uh, it's extremely expensive and it also wobbles and it's heavy. Uh, then you've got your Surefires. Then you have new stuff like the dead airs and stuff like that. So I don't know which y can YHM is YHM best. YHM is super nice. YHM is super nice. You haven't tried it. It may not but. last as long as a Surefire. But, and that's the other thing is durability. Like how long can these cans actually last for prolonged use yeah. and or full auto, which most people don't have to worry about the full auto aspect too much. Yeah. But if you had to, that's the funny thing. If Select Fire was actually legal, more of these suppressor companies would probably worry about rating their cans to full auto. A lot of cans are it. full auto rated, but yeah, I don't know if they're it's not are, a huge but... selling point for most no. consumers. But... Especially if it's a civilian yeah. company that's not trying to get contracts. Like, it, obviously, like this NT4 and Surefire makes a can for this gun. Obviously, that's having to deal with extra riggers that a normal can isn't because it's obviously a belt fed where you're shooting through 200 rounds over the course of 60 seconds, depending on what you're doing with a 60 massive... seconds? Why does it take so long? <sighs> I mean, bursts and you know, controlled yeah. fire. But, uh, and so they have to do stuff a little differently than what some folks are able to do with like, this can is dead air, probably not rated for saw use. Um, and I yeah. maybe, I'm sure it's rated for full auto. I don't know how much full auto I want to run. I could, I could pop that lower off and stick that on there. The air blackout also cycles super fast when it's suppressed. Um, so that's always fine. It just spits them out. That MCX over there is actually my fastest, well, uh, besides yeah. the full auto Glock. That gun is probably the fastest, and uh, it's 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 too fast. It yeah. really is. So, yeah, as so, far as full auto goes. And as far as ammo goes, like, um, 
again, think of the whole weapon system. So I remember when 7.62x39 <laughs> was super cheap because it was being imported from Russia in vast quantities, even 5.4R, yeah. uh, vast quantities being imported. But now uh, that is not permitted. And so the stockpiles of that ammunition are going down. The reason for owning that particular platform uh, is also kind of diminished. So think about the whole system. Um, I would say if I were living in certain places, I would probably switch to the AK platform based on ammunition availability. It all so, depends. Yeah. 545 is very cool, but some of the coolest 545 bullets uh, or ammunition not available here or not readily available here. Yeah, so, I think AK yeah. guns in general here in the States are overrated as a prepper choice. Uh, seeing as 5.56 is the most common round in America, and it's the most popular rifle in America as of the past, I would say probably five, six years, decade uh, after the past few shootings. Like the AR-15 is, I mean, you can buy them now for 500 bucks. Well, not maybe right now, but they were, when they were in stock, you could get one for like $500. Um, I just don't think AKs are as good as they once were as far as like a prepper, be prepared type of a gun. And there's another thing, I talk about this a lot, I won't talk about it too long, but there's the other thing, which is the, and this goes back to what we talked about at the beginning, which is cultural desensitization. Mm -hmm. People have been desensitized thanks to Hollywood and thanks to just everything that's been going on for the past 20 years, that AKs equal bad guy gun. Like if the dude has an AK, he'd be a bad guy. So if I grab a gun to go deal with someone or deal with a thing, or maybe I'm guarding a business during a time of a protest and I've got an AK, it is m much more likely that regular folks in public passing by are gonna look at me and go, he looks like a bad guy. Whereas if I have an American rifle, like the quintessential American rifle, and I have this and it looks somewhat professional, got an optic on it, maybe I've got a suppressor, Maybe I've got a PEC-15 on it, Maybe, and I've got a weapon line. Nothing is that more professional. That does not look like a bad guy gun, thanks to what culture has been perpetuating in Hollywood and just in culture in general, where Kalashnikovs equal the bad guy gun, which obviously, that shouldn't be the case, because like anyone can take a gun and like execute their will with it. Uh, but grabbing an AK as my counteractive shooter gun is probably a really bad idea when people are start calling in 911 and going, there's a guy with an AK-47. And so then the cops responding, no, there's a dude with an AK-47 running around. And then as soon as they see me with my AK-47, they immediately assume I'm the bad guy. So I think it's just a, a poor choice for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, 545 is also ammo that can get kind of rare at times. 762 by 39 is a little more common, uh, but I really think there's really no reason to get an AK. I know people are like, oh, it's more durable than ARs. They don't break. Like, fun fact, my really expensive Alpha AK, which is $2,800, and my Arsenal 104 FR, which was about $900. Those have both malfunctioned worse than my ARs, where you get the casing like deep down in like the guts of the actual gun. Like both of those guns have actually malfunctioned with like decent ammo uh, more than a bunch of my ARs have. Like modern ARs now, I would argue, are more reliable in a bunch of different areas uh, than AKs. And people are usually drawing that comparison of AKs being more reliable than ARs, comparing an M16A1 back from like the 70s to an AK back then, absolutely. All day, every day, AK back then, awesome. M16A1, horrible, no chrome lining, lots of other problems. Uh, but now, comparing an AK to something like, you know, uh, you know a Mark 18, uh, an MCX, a 416, like, no, it's just not happening. So, yeah. and they're not super cheap. If you get an AK for $500, uh, but they're pretty hard to find for 500. Um, that might be one thing, like a truck gun that's like super cheap. You can just throw around and like, you know. And 762 by 39, nice out of short barrels. Yeah. But I will say another so. cool thing about the AR platform is when the AK was designed, it was gonna be made very cheaply out of giant factories and the AR was more expensive because the machine milling that was required well, you know, it's not the 60s anymore. It's actually very hard to get those giant factories up and running to make some of that stuff, whereas almost every machine shop in the United States has the capability to make almost every component of the AR-15. Maybe so, not the barrel, probably not coat the barrel properly, but the important guts of this can be machined using really simple milling machines um, and that is a really cool thing that's happened in the last, uh, last uh, No, years. we won't be doing a Tim Kennedy collab. He doesn't think 19-year-olds should be able to own Air 15s. So. And your uh, 
too young for that video. I'm, <laughs> I'm too young for that video because so I'm like 16. No, uh, we don't we don't associate with people. Yeah, no. Right. I thought I you were that. gonna. Go, uh, were you gonna circle back to my five seven pistol no, comments? I, no, okay. I'm not. Well, the funny you say that because yeah, he was paid to say it's like the greatest gun ever, but um, because he does stuff with FN. Uh, I still like the system. <laughs> if it's full auto, yes, the P90 would be sick. If it was full auto and you could run a short barrel, but thanks to all these laws, you don't have it. Someone asked. Can the NFA be repealed in our lifetime? So, how young are you? If they're you or me, I would say potentially. Now, here, yeah. here's where I actually think we we could actually see some change, and that's at a state level. Now, there have been a number of states recently who have passed laws saying if you manufacture suppressors in our state and you don't take them out of state lines, you can do that without doing the whole tax stamp thing. Uh, uh, Kansas was one of them. Uh, Tennessee was one of them. The downside Oklahoma. to these states doing them in Oklahoma is the ATF goes, no, we're still going to prosecute. We're still going to do X, Y, Z, even if you go with your own state's laws. So what I think is going to happen over the next decade or so is we're going to see more um, butting of heads potentially in certain states with the ATF. And if some stuff gets taken up to the Supreme Court, that could set some really good uh, precedent as far as, no, states get to decide what they do with gun stuff. If they want to make machine guns legal, ATF, you're out of it. If they want to have their own FFLs, they can do their own thing. So what I'm actually hoping for is states can actually uh, be able to deal with that themselves and start to actually get away from the ATF. So it's possible that in 10 years you could have states that go, you know what, we're not recognizing the ATF. None of our state law enforcement is going to enforce it. Uh, county law enforcement's not going to enforce it. ATF, you're out of here. Um, we're going to do our own FFL system where we sell guns. We're going to figure out our own thing. Suppressors used in state are legal. So then everyone in that state can manufacture, own, sell, buy, everything in state. Um, that's what I'm hoping will happen in the next 10, 20 years. I don't think the ATF is going to shut down anytime soon. I don't think we're going to see any laws at a federal level anytime soon, you know, shutting down parts of the ATF or part of the NFA. Um, but I'm hoping for more states' rights in some of these issues. And we've seen that already yeah. um, with some of these states going, you know what, we can do our own stuff with suppressors. Now, the problem is the ATF still controls so much of the kind of the way guns are sold between companies yeah. and that it becomes, it's been hard to kind of yeah. get around that. But I think in time, we might see some change in that area. In That's order, what I'm hoping for. Yeah, in order to do that, you kind of need the legislature to be on board. And the interesting yep. thing is how on board with this idea different legislatures have been. But you also need your, your judiciary guys to actually tell... Uh, the federal judges and the ATF to get out. Now, I would recommend that you guys go back and watch um, a video that we posted, uh, I forget when exactly, earlier this year about constitutional carry in Tennessee. Because in that video, you will see a whole bunch of interviews with Tennessee reps and senators. And some of those guys, um, I mean, everybody in the video that was interviewed by us was on board with expanding firearm rights for Tennessee citizens. And obviously they wanna see that for American citizens across the board. Yep. I want you to be encouraged by the fact that there are some young guys that are getting into politics now that actually have a really solid understanding of the Second Amendment. And they actually have a really solid understanding of freedom, and they actually want to accomplish that. So be encouraged that the possibilities for this to happen do, in fact, exist. Now, is it? there's a lot of people commenting on how terrible politics is. You're 100% right. It's worse than you imagine. Talking about how pointless voting is, I don't argue uh, that... It can be very difficult to get certain changes done through voting, but there's a lot of ways that you can get a lot of local changes done by voting. If there's nobody good to vote for in your district, get together with your like-minded people, figure out if there are candidates that you can run. Young guys that have a proper understanding of freedom. There are so many folks that are in the Tennessee legislature right now, that is the case. They came back from Afghanistan, they wanted to get stuff done in their local communities. They worked with people in their local communities, just helping people. Their local guys were like, hey, why don't you run for office? We'll support you here. We'll support you there. We'll fund your campaign. And now, uh, Micah Van Hus is an example of this. He managed to get the uh, Barrett uh, named Tennessee official uh, yeah. state rifle. That's pretty um, legit. And has some the extremely M82 fantastic. Did it, was it a model specifically? It was the M82 It was a specific I model, I, I believe so, I'm not sure. Yeah. But anyway, he is he's pushing the ball down the field, and his goal is total firearms freedom. There are guys like that in the system. Are they in the White House? No. 
but they're in the state legislatures. And if you can find them and you can support them and you can help them or help guys who are 90% there, 80% there, if you can have conversations with them and help them to have a greater understanding for the need for freedom, if you can help them uh, personally improve, or if you can find guys who are better than the people who are there and get them elected instead, that actually does have a tremendous effect. It doesn't have a tremendous effect tomorrow, not the day after the election, not the year after the election, but it does have an effect in your lifetime. So that is something that I would recommend that people be thinking about, trying to figure out ways that they could contribute and help to the cultural change as uh, the way that people see weapons and the way that people see personal responsibility uh, and the problems with a giant centralized government. Uh, but at the same time, be working inside of your local governments um, to get us back to upholding and adhering to the Constitution. Yep. These are doable things. They're just very hard struggles. So yeah. Take those let's, uh, let's deal with a few questions. Someone was asking what we think about SIG, and this guy says, considering Lucas has a SIG MCX, you probably have a good opinion of the company. Well, the answer is they dropped the ball on a lot of stuff. Uh, the MCX is one of their only products that I actually like. Uh, I shoot I like the 320s the, as well. Uh, I, I like the P365 now. Yeah, it's better. Um, P365. But they, they drop a lot of balls when it comes to releasing products and quality control and stuff like that. So I'm not a raving fan of SIG. Um, if I was, I would have everything they make. Um, I don't really run their Even, optics. Uh, I am I am messing with the Tango 6. Uh, you guys may not be able to see in the camera. But I'm messing with this new scope, um, which is on my 416. I was shooting that the other day. Um, but I'm not a massive fan of the company. Again, I'm not a huge fan of Glock as a company, um, just for a lot of different reasons. But obviously, I run their pistols. Their pistols are really good. Um, I don't actually know of a single firearms manufacturer. Well, I like BCM a lot, although they're not real public about certain things. They've said a few things here and there that I've really liked, but I don't know of a single firearms company that's like the the... I don't know, where, where their essence is everything that I really like about them. I, I don't know if there is one. Well, Barrett Maybe is HK. very solid. No, I was kidding. Uh, Barrett <laughs> is very Barrett, solid. Barrett, that's true. I've wanted they, to get some of their guns for they that They have reason. set some good examples. Like one example they have is if a firearm is not available to civilians in a state, they will not sell that yes, firearm to law enforcement cool. in the state. That is a stance that we totally legit. have copied from them. Yep. Um, and we body really armor, like things that. like that. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because we uh, we sell Glock mags. Every once in a while, we'll get a, an email from an officer in California like, hey, will you sell this to me? And we're like, no, sorry. Like, we can't ship those other people there, so we're not shipping it to you. Yeah, so thank um, you, Barrett, for so, setting that, yeah, that example because we appreciate it. Yep. Um, how'd you get that machine gun? You can Google 0702 <laughs> SOT. Uh, we are a yes. firearms manufacturer. Um, yes, definitely. So Google, Google that. that. We're not going to yeah. explain it. People, you can either pay a lot of money, or pay a lot of money and ju jump hoops. Uh, there's there's a couple different ways. Uh, binary triggers, stupid waste of money. Um, there's only like one instance in which I would consider running one. The problem with binary triggers is if you really aren't careful in how you're running the trigger, you can outrun the reset essentially, and basically you have to recharge the gun. Uh, that's the, one of the biggest issues with binary triggers. What, what is the instance that you would do it? Uh, if I'm pressing the trigger, oh, where I would run it? Yeah. Uh, the only instance I've seen where, and I have, I would want to run one. I saw a guy who took a heavy barrel, like an 18-inch barrel. Mm -hmm. He basically built an IAR, uh, so like the new saw that or saw that's getting fielded to the Marine Corps. Um, so he built a heavy barreled gun with a bipod. He ran 60 round mags or something like that, and he was treating it like a little saw. Thing. Uh, and he was saying that from prone with the binary trigger, it actually worked pretty well. But again, I'm like, eh, if I have a guy's the SD3G or an SSAE, like I could still yeah. get 0.11 splits. Um, I'm good to go and it's more accurate and I'm not committed to firing two rounds. Binary triggers though, you can usually turn off the binary aspect, but the, the trigger's but trash. Like it's not that great. If I'm going to drop that kind of money, I, I want a good two stage or single stage uh, trigger. So yeah. binary triggers, I think they're a bit of a gimmick, but yeah. again, they're a gimmick that exists because of the unconstitutional infringements that we have today. If we had it? full auto, binary triggers wouldn't be a thing. We wouldn't have them. We wouldn't have to have this weird, neutered, full auto, stupid thing. We would just have select fire. And Do you know what like, we would probably eh. have? You what? know the electronic triggers inside of paintball guns, where oh, you can yeah. dial your rate of fire in directly and adjust a whole bunch of stuff so about the trigger pack? I know I was working with someone on that. Yeah, well, Last a bunch year. of people make these for the military market, particularly for crew, uh, service weapon, and vehicle-mounted weapons. Yes. This would be a thing that people would be experimenting with if it wasn't expressly uh, banned. For bad. 
Yeah. DOS stupid. is verboten. Yeah. Um, Ned one restock. I'm uh, sure soon. Uh, no idea though. I'm not the one to ask about uh, inventory. Yeah. Uh, you can email the guys though at uh, team at trex-arms.com. They'll help you. We have a, a, a our customer service team is actually growing. Uh, there's a bunch of people over there every day, um, and we try to get back to stuff really fast. So. Um, uh, people are asking about HR 5717. I have no idea what bill that is. I can't I remember. I believe that's the armor body ban. Armor, body armor ban being presented. Uh, yeah, that's I don't know if hugely, it's go hugely problematic. By the way, yeah, I'm not sure if it's you have to stop we'll and see. think why the government that wants to protect you wants you to take wants you to not be able to have stuff that protects you. Yeah, in the interest body of public armor, safety, you cannot have safety equipment. Like body armor is li li like it's probably the most passive thing for protecting your bode. And they want to ban it. Like, it's the most passive. Like, the only way you could use it aggressively is if you pulled the plate out of your carrier and you wanted to use it like, you know, guys in movies, you know, kill dudes with shields. Like, you'd have to use it like a weapon. That's the only offensive way you could really run armor. And Otherwise, is, it's just to keep place, you alive. That's the place for steel armor, though. That's true. That's the only time I recommend steel armor is, <laughs> apart from being on vehicles, is pulling it out of the carrier and, like, you know, yeah. stabbing someone. Um, but, yeah, they want to ban. You know things are are bad or the government's up to no good when they want to ban body armor. Like anything that we're doing that makes them uncomfortable because they don't understand it or they don't need it, they're like, ah, they shouldn't have it. Um, not a fan. I'm sure they're going to push body armor bans whenever there's a shooting in the future uh, where someone is like running armor, uh, it'll come up. So in a few yeah. years or whatever, I'm sure it'll come up. There have been shooters in the past who've had armor, but it was like old Vietnam flak vests. I, I'm not aware of any incidents, at least none of the big ones that have been on the news, where the uh, suspect had like legit body armor, like level three, level four plates, um, who was doing his stuff. It's all like they, the media goes, ah, he had body armor, and it's just like a vest that just holds mags. Like it's there's no armor yeah, stuff going on. Um, I do think Tom but, Sizemore probably had some on. When he robbed that bank that one time with Val Kilmer and uh, Rob De Niro. Uh, I think he had armor on, but they might have had like soft armor, but that wouldn't have stopped yeah. the, the the five five six. It's from the only the real FNC. world example I so, can think of. Yeah, I just they'll come for armor at some point, just like they'll come for night vision. And that's one reason why we're really trying to push body armor really hard and talking about it. Um, offering it to you guys and being able to also talk about and show night vision. Uh, the more people that can see it and see that it's normal, the more, you know, the, the easier of a time we'll have when they actually come for it and people being like, oh no, I've seen dudes running around with night vision and body armor for like years. Like, it's totally fine. Why are we trying to ban this thing that I actually know something about? Um, and that's the reason why we need companies that are able to produce content on these things so that in five, 10 years when they come to ban it, people actually know what's going on. Because most people are like, oh, this thing's being banned. Oh, I don't know what that is. Eh, I don't care. Like that's a freedom I don't need. But when people can see folks using it, doing stuff with it, and they actually understand what's going on, um, they're like, okay, like we don't need to ban this thing because they actually know about it. Education, again, it's, yeah. it's key. The way we educate now is going to affect the gun laws and the regulations that we are either oppressed onto us or that we can actually win back in the next 10 to 20 years. And I, and so. I want to encourage you guys that we're seeing a lot of really positive movement. I remember, um, this is when you were really little, we did some work for um, Gun Owners of America, producing videos for, for them, and uh, those are back in the VHS tape days. Do you have any idea how completely unacceptable it would have been for like the Magpul Dynamic DVDs to be sold at that time, and yet, the Magpul dynamic, like art of carbine and art of pistol, oh, yeah. the, the ideas in those DVDs and the fact that those were so widely accepted by people is a tremendous change away from the kind of stuff that uh, was available to the public in the 80s and the 90s. And the internet made it um, findable by everybody, purchasable by everybody. It was so widely viewed, it completely changed the way that a lot of people thought about certain things, about using carbines, uh, for personal defense and the defense of others. And not just the idea of that, but some actual tactics and techniques that are quite good. And uh, that really paved the way for a lot of stuff, but it was also a very interesting aha moment for me when I saw this and I was like, this is exactly what I've always wanted my entire life. And millions of people are buying this because they want this too. Yep. How did we get to this point? Isn't it wonderful that we're here? Um, so there's been a lot of positive movement in my life, even as the government has gotten worse from the top down. Uh, I think that the, the people of America who are interested in taking personal responsibility and interested in things like this 
Um, I have seen a lot of improvement um, in the way that we talk about stuff um, and the number of people who are interested uh, just since uh, just since I've been around. Yep. So I, I am incredibly encouraged uh, by all of that. Even all right. as problematic stuff. Is okay, so I'm going to go ahead and smash through a bunch of questions super fast, hopefully one-liners, and we'll see. CZ Brand 2. Actually, I haven't shot one. The first one had a lot of problems. Uh, do we offer training courses? Not at this time, although... Asking if you you know a few months. Uh, 320X carry, not a bad gun, um, but I'd say just get a normal 320. Uh, the X carry has a few a few benefits, but I actually prefer my standard 320s more than my X5, more than my other like special uh, special 320s. I prefer just the standard one even more. Um, so uh, why do $5,000 NVGs, uh, no batteries, only have shelf life of five years? Uh, most of these products are given a shelf life due to military contracts. Uh, night vision doesn't just die in five years. Um, I've had night vision, the 31s that I've had, I've had for three years. I don't even know if they have an expiration. I'm sure they have it somewhere on the you know, packaging that goes to the, you know, the military when they're sold to the military, but no. Uh, night vision doesn't just die after five years. Expirations are generally put on stuff for purchasing, also tracking when it came in, when it needs to exit out. Uh, and for the military, five years of service, they're, if they're actually being used, it probably is time to get a new set, depending on how much wear and tear yeah. and repairs and stuff they've had. So that's why they usually have like a ex, you know an expiration date. Mm -hmm. um, like tourniquets, tourniquets have an expiration date. No, they don't just fall apart and turn to dust after three years or two years, wherever it is. Uh, but it does depend if they're in the sun, if they're exposed, it, are they in a bag? What weather are they in? Like I've got tourniquets that have been around for, uh, they probably expired years ago, but they are in bags, so they're gonna be fine. Um, so, uh, stop playing Candy Crush, yeah. Uh, is 10.5 too short? No, no, it's not. Uh, not for 5.56, that is. You might ask, like, 308, something like that. Like, that's definitely yeah. a unique barrel length if you're trying to run a larger round, uh, like a short FAL or G3. Um, I'd say 5.56, you're good to go. That's a 10.3, that's a 10.5, that's a, that's a 300 block out there. That's a 10.4. Uh, I've got a bunch of 10-inch guns here on the table, and they all run great. Uh, what is the legality of using NFA items for self-defense? So there's uh, so there are federal laws regarding body armor, uh, suppressors, SBRs, and machine guns. Um, if you are found guilty of something in the process of using one of those, there are mandatory minimums. Uh, I believe a machine gun is a mandatory minimum of 25 years. So if I were to use this in home defense and somehow it was ruled unjustified, uh, essentially I would automatically get a 25 years added to my sentence because I used an NFA machine gun uh, during that. If it was an illegal machine gun, it would probably be even higher. Um, so there is some stuff that gets on there. I'm not sure what suppressors are. I'm not sure what SBRs are. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's a good shoot, it's a good shoot. Um, I've heard of a few where guys have actually run. There was one from a long time ago. A guy had a full auto M14, um, but it was a justified shoot, so he was fine, even though he ran a machine gun. Um, I know guys that have run suppressors and it's been fine. You know, it all depends on, is it a good shoot? Is it a justified shoot? Um, and that's really what it comes down to more than what kind of gun you're using. Yes. So, um, is Spartan Air 500 body armor legit? It's probably one of the more legit ones, but I'd say don't bother with steel. Um, save up, get it, get a chest rig instead, stay mobile or save up and get lighter plates. Uh, mobility is key. Um, uh, Bushmaster Masada doesn't exist. Um, the ACR, uh, not a fan. So uh, I've got one. It's also select fire, but no, I'm not a fan of it at all. Is um, it working again? When are they? Are we off? Are we on? We're on. We're on? Okay, cool. It's gone off screen. I was just gonna uh, ask, is that ACR working? Where again? are they? Yes, it is. Uh, it blew the gas, the piston, and it, like blew up. Uh, I knew what happened? To when you. are they adding you in Call of Duty? Uh, they probably aren't because I told them I wasn't that interested in being a character in the game. So, um, really, am not. Uh, what's your favorite 9mm defensive ammo? I shoot Spear 124 grain, or I don't shoot it. I have it in my gun, um, but there's other um, other calibers out there you can get. Or not how, calibers, how round often, types. How often do you shoot it and swap year, it out? A year, Once six a year? months. Uh, if I accidentally shoot it sooner, <laughs> that happens as well. Uh, the Engal is super expensive, yes, but it's probably the best laser on the market right now. Um, but it's hard to get because of stupid regulations we have for lasers, thanks to the FDA. Um, which is stupid, but whatever. Are lasers a food? Or a drug. I guess they are. They're one of the... Well, they're a gateway drug yes. to far greater things. Um, was but, the setup. But yeah, but no. Um, long distance rifle engage and bolt action. Uh, I actually would far prefer a gas gun, but I don't do long range, so I don't know anything. At this point, we don't do long Holy range in Tennessee, but at this point, uh, 
pretty much everybody agrees that the only reason to go with a bolt gun would be cost if you need extreme accuracy. Otherwise, the gas guns are there. Yeah, gas guns are and, great. Uh, the, all the guys I know are switching to gas guns. All the functionality, good enough now to all the run functionality for stuff. is there. Um, great com people, great company. Thanks, I appreciate that. Man, same questions over and over. I answered this already. I know, Holy this is moly. how YouTube Wait, works. Yeah, I don't like it. They're like, you didn't answer my question the way I wanted, so I'm gonna ask again. This is why <laughs> we have the email address, which I forgot it, to well, mention. T-Rex talk. People were saying we weren't looking at it. Arms.com. People were saying we weren't looking at it, which is probably true. We weren't looking at it. I was sometimes right. looking at it. Um, no rules equals idiots can get full auto. Fun fact: idiots can already get full auto if they go and just buy one. So no, making it legal doesn't just mean what you're thinking. Uh, they're not going to go out and buy saws because uh, you got to have money to buy saws. Generally, it means you have to be responsible to have a job and be able to save money and then be able to buy that thing. And I don't know very many idiots that are financially responsible. If they're already financially responsible, they're not usually idiots. Kind of funny how that logic works, you know? Unless you're like a trust fund baby. Those do exist. But if you're financially responsible, then like you're not going to be a moron. Um, small plates work okay with the over. Absolutely. Uh, guys, the URGI. Never shot one. It's a standard upper with a 10.3 M-locked rail or 14.5, whatever. Um, but I haven't run one, but it's essentially an AR. So like whatever. Um, is a scar worth the money? Not really. Uh, ish. Uh, if it's the 308 one, don't. I would yeah. say don't bother with the 556 uh, to get a normal AR instead. Um, oh, that's what I should do for my 308. What gun. if I shoot? Just have one of your scars. Here's a question. What if shoot is justified but gun is illegal? You're probably going to face weapons charges at least. Um, and so yeah. And that's why we need to get these rules fixed so that like I can run like stuff without having to do stupid paperwork. Um, but yeah, you'll get you'll get firearms charges most likely, even if it's a justified shoot. They'll be like, yeah, totally good to go. But he did have a machine gun, which, you know, thanks to culture, is like a nuke. So uh, you're probably still going to get in trouble. Um, surgeon's rifle. I don't know which ones that is. They make bolt guns. Maybe they make a gas gun now. I don't know. Purse, IR laser. Still testing them. Haven't had much time. Don't know what's going on with those. Um, they may not hold zero real well is what I've heard. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, primary arms. They make and sell things. So anyway, sure all right. Do. Well, that's enough questions. We'll <laughs> do more later on the next live, which will be next uh, Wednesday, unless we have something going on. I think we do. Um, but I hope that uh, hope that answers some of y'all's questions and um, just going over some of these things, sort of so the sentiments and kind of the ideas that Isaac and I were talking about on this live are all shared here at T Rex Arms with. The other partners with the guys here, the guys behind the camera, Chad and Charles, like these are things we talk about all the time. Like how can we make America better? How can we change the way things are? Even though right now we have it pretty good. Like I don't want people to sit here and be like, oh, I can't own a machine gun. America sucks. Like, no, we still have it pretty good in this country. Yes, we've got some horrible taxes. Yes, we've got some horrible, you know, justice system stuff that goes on. But for the most part, our country is still pretty awesome. If you actually travel around the world, go to other places and actually see what's going on. So don't just think because you can't own a toy that you want or a certain thing or a certain item that we're like the worst country in the world. I yeah. see that being talked about a lot nowadays because uh, celebrities complaining about how horrible America is while they live in a mansion and they have it super easy. And it's like, go to Africa for like a week and then you'll come back and really appreciate what we have here in America even more. So I think that's something people really need to understand, but yeah. also understand that we can make America even better. We can yes. make America even more awesome, but only if you are willing to get up and do things or support people that are doing things or go out and do stuff on your own. You can actually affect culture and laws on your own as an individual or get together with some of your buddies. And even you going to a gun range and taking your suppressor and just people seeing you at the indoor range shooting with your suppressor, even that can go a long way. If you got you know, tens of thousands of Americans doing that every weekend, we would definitely see some cultural change as far as suppressors go and then SBRs go. And then if guys started running around with more machine guns, we'd probably see more of that with machine guns. I think machine gun rental companies have done a really good job at that. Some of them, uh, some of them do like to keep it more elite. Like, oh no, you're not allowed to actually like touch the gun. Uh, like it's this weird thing. And it's like, no, it's just a gun that shoots faster. Like it's not some weird atomic bomb. So um, there's a lot of things we can be doing. I'm really hopeful for the future. Uh, I think that's something we all should, you know, be hopeful for, even though 2020 got off to a really unique start and, uh, we're not done by any means. Uh, well, it might get